Uh, as we open God's word this morning, uh, we are kind of, we're kind of continuing and kind of not continuing in talking about uh, our, our vision of uh, bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to every household in the Hop- Hopkins community. And, and we have, so we have this vision. In the next seven years, this is what we're going to do. We're going to bring God's gospel, the message of Jesus Christ, that Christ died for our sins, that, that our sins are washed away in his blood, that we can be redeemed, renewed, restored in our relationship to God. We're going to bring that to every household in the Hopkins community. And we, we have this geographical location from 131 to A37, from uh, 142nd Street to 116th, A222 there. That is our, our area, our, 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 the, the kind of place that God has called us to bring this good news of Jesus Christ to. And so we're going to be doing this over the next seven years. And we, we're going to do that, we say, through, uh, through expectant prayer, through effective evangelism, and through radical obedience to the Holy Spirit. And all those things, I think, go together because we can't effectively evangelize if we are not connected to God through expectant prayer, praying that God will empower us and expecting that he's going to work through us as he says in scripture that he will. We, we, we go in the knowledge that, that God has promised to go with us everywhere that we go. And, and, and we're, we're doing this through a radical obedience to the Holy Spirit because how many people on their own would just randomly go and talk to people about the gospel. You just find anybody around you and, and, and do that. Go knock on doors and whatever else, right? Anybody? Anybody feeling real super bold? Right? We, it's not a normal thing for us to do, but we're going to go in radical obedience to the Holy Spirit because God has called us to. The Spirit of God is in us and empowers us to go out into the world and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ with us wherever we go. We believe this because Scripture has said that the Holy Spirit is in us if we are in Christ. So, that is our, our big vision and, and for the past several weeks in, in uh, May and June and, and, and July, we have been talking about what effective evangelism is. And we did this through uh, a series called The Nine Arts of Spiritual Conversations. We talked about things like listening and noticing. We talked about things like praying and, 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 uh, and welcoming and uh, th- th- this idea of, of hospitality and asking questions, ways, tools in our tool belt or, or clubs in our evangelism golf bag, as you, if you will, to to build relationships and have spiritual conversations with people. And for the next three weeks, we're going to be talking very specifically about the last art, which was the art of sharing. Now, we talked about the art of sharing as being the opportunity that we have to share uh, Jesus with other people. And, and, and one of the ways that we do that is by talking about who who Jesus is to us, the impact that Jesus has had on our lives. Why is he worth knowing? Uh, Because if he's just some guy, if he's just some, some, you know, writer, author, teacher, whatever, some good guy, there's a lot of good people out in the world to follow. Why is Jesus different? What, What about Jesus has impacted and changed your life. So that's one of the ways you get to tell your story. You get to tell about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for you. There's another aspect, another component of that though, which is the very specific gospel message. Because what Jesus has done for you, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, is is specific to the message of the gospel as it is laid out in the Bible. That and so we're going we're gonna to talk about that in, in sort of three different groupings. And, and this is going to be, I hope, I pray, kind of a very practical way of laying out the gospel message to anyone that you encounter to be able to share that message, the biblical message of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done or who, who God is, what God has done in Jesus Christ with anyone that you encounter. That you can do that and you can do it comfortably. You can do it confidently and and lay out the very crux of our faith because that's what we're called to do right of all the things that that we reference and look back to time and time and time again there is one great commission that we are all called to that those who are disciples followers of Jesus Christ 
are called to go into all the world and make disciples, to, to preach the gospel, to, to, it says, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, to teach them everything that, that he, Jesus, has commanded them, and, and he will be with us always to the very end of the age. And this is at the core of what it means to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. Not that we're good people, not that we're just, you know, good citizens, not that we're just, you know, good neighbors, but that we are bringing a message, the message of Jesus Christ. This is something that is, there's lots of good people. You probably have neighbors that you, you know, that you generally like because they're nice people. They'll help you out if you ask for it and so on and so forth. But something that makes followers of Jesus different is that we have, we have a message, the message of Jesus We didn't fix ourselves, but that he fixed it for us. He has redeemed us. He has made us in right relationship. And the reality for us, and and, and this is a hard reality, I think, for us in Hopkins in particular, because Hopkins is such a nice place. We've talked about this before. Hopkins is a wonderful place, and everybody's super nice. And, you know, even Door, they're they're pretty nice there too. And and Watson and, you know, all these these places around here. Like, it's it's a good community. It's a nice, it's rural. We're, We're kind of all... You know, like we, we, we help each other. Everybody seems to be really good together. And the reality though, the, the stark reality for us is that over 60, probably 65, probably two thirds of everyone in this community doesn't know Jesus. Two thirds. Uh, and I'm not making that number up. That's, a, that's like a, a census statistic. Two thirds of this community would consider themselves de-churched people or unchurched people, or they would affiliate with no religion whatsoever. Two-thirds. That's a lot. And so, I think it's pretty easy for us, in Hopkins in particular, to say, ah, you know, the, the, the Great Commission thing, that's, that's for places like New York City, or you know, big city places where, you know, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, there's lots, lots more people there. And there's obviously lots more people that don't know Jesus there, right? Some of us would even go, and, and I'm going to say this, and I don't, I don't mean it in, in any sort of way whatsoever, but in Hopkins, it's really easy for us to say, well, you know, those liberal places, those, those are the places that need Jesus. In Hopkins, we're okay here, Right? We have these boxes and ways that we like to think about things that actually are excuses for us to, to, to not feel like we have to share the gospel. And that's a problem. And if you add to it the fact that we're not necessarily comfortable articulating the gospel, well, we have two problems. is that we, we don't feel like we need to, and then we don't feel comfortable doing it even if we have to. But the call, <laughs> the call of Jesus as he's going into heaven is what? Go and preach the gospel. And we have to take that seriously. We have to take that seriously. And so the idea, the idea for the next three weeks is that we are going to talk about specifics about how we can share that gospel message, how we can turn a normal conversation into a gospel conversation. And what it starts with, draw a nice circle here, what it starts with is God's design. Because for us and for scripture, everything begins with God. I know you probably can't see that and that's terrible handwriting, but just go with it for a little bit. Everything begins with God. And so we're going to begin at the beginning. If you have a Bible with you, feel free to open it right now to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with this chapter a little bit. Uh, if you've been in Sunday school for, you know, did Sunday school, if you've been hanging around the church for any length of time, you've probably heard this, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, dot, 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 let there be light, let there be an expanse, let the waters be gathered into one place. Let dry ground appear. Let the ground produce vegetation. Let, 
Uh, let the, the, the stars and, and the sun and the moon be present in the sky. He says, let the air team, let the air produce, or the, the sky produce birds and the water produce uh, fish. He says, let the land produce living creatures. That takes us up to verse 26 when God said, let us make mankind in our image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea, uh, fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over every living creature that moves along the ground. And God says, for you... I give every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit and seed in it, they will be your food, yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made. And it was, we said this two weeks ago, it was very good. It was tov me'od. Me'od. It had the greatness of God in it. As, as great as it could be. It was me'od good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. And on the seventh day God had finished uh, the work that he had been doing. So on the seventh day he rested from all his work. God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Now, if you still have your Bibles open with me a second, I want you to flip over to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. We have this creation narrative that talks all about everything. God creates everything. We're going to talk about that in a minute. This is God's design. It's God's world. It's his rules. He created all things. The psalmist reflects in this though. Psalm 139, if you look at verse 13, he says this, Lord, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. How precious are your thoughts, O Lord. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I'm awake, I am still with you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the beginning of a gospel conversation has to do with God's design. Because God has a design for everything. He created all things. And he loves us. We get this idea in the book of Colossians. For in him all things were created. And he's talking about Jesus Christ. In him, the son, who is the image of the invisible God... It, the firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Hebrews 11 says it this way, For by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. In other words, the, the writer of Hebrews says that God created everything out of nothing. We call this creation ex nihilo. In other words, not, that before creation, there was nothing. And we have to think about it this way too. There, there, was, there can't be anything prior to creation because anything that has an eternal being is God. And so if there was something that God created creation out of, it would stand at the same level as God. God is God. There is no other beside him. And so God creates all things. He designs all things from the smallest cell to the greatest mountains, the planets, the stars. If you were, if you were here a couple of years ago, you remember that the video I showed of, of the, just the size comparison between, uh, between 
you know, atoms and, and, you know, plants and then planets and stars and some of the biggest stars in the universe are actually as big or right around the size of our galaxy. Like there's just, there's things out there that are so ginormous. God creates every single one of them. He designed them. He is the creator, the preeminent one. In Revelation, we see in the throne room of God, the angels and all of the creatures around the throne, they are bowing down and worshiping, saying, you are worthy, O our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This is important. It is the place that we have to start these conversations. It is God's design and no other. And because God is the designer, he is the one who designates what the purpose is for all things. He is the one who gives things their meaning. He is the one who gives things their purpose. This is an, another important thing because create, or because the world right now likes to tell us that, that You are the definer of your own meaning and you are the definer of your own purpose. You can do whatever you want. But if we are seeking, truly seeking any sort of meaning, we have to seek meaning outside of ourselves, first of all, because if we find meaning within ourselves alone, what happens? What's going to happen at the end of your life? You're going to die. Yep, happens 100%. So far, 100% of people die. And when you find meaning only in yourselves, what happens to your meaning at the end of your life? It, it dies, right? Let's think about it this way. If you were to find meaning in some human-made institution, you, you name it, don't care. How many human-made institutions have lasted for all of eternity? How many? Zero. Thank you. No thing has lasted for eternity. The the greatest empires in the world in history have all come to nothing. They're artifacts at best. Right? What is the only thing that has lasted from eternity to eternity? God. And so God, who is the creator and the designer, is the one who gives purpose and meaning, and he is the one that we look to for our purpose and meaning as well. Colossians 1 verse 18 says, He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. Right? It all holds together in him, and he is supreme over it all. In other words, God gives purpose. And when God gives purpose, we don't get to redefine purpose for him. Right? He is the one. And so, if he is the one, then we have to look to scripture, his revelation, to find out what God's purpose is. We all have been designed by him, and therefore we are given purpose by him. And, and that purpose for ourselves, our own person, who we are, we are given a purpose. What is the chief end of man? To glorify God and enjoy him forever. <laughs> We're given purpose for our work life, right? God shows us what it is to work and, and, and he, he lays that out throughout scripture. He gives us purpose in our resting life, right? After he's done working, God rests and he calls us to do the same, right? He, God gives purpose to relationships. Right? He gives, well, he gives, first of all, he gives purpose to creation, right? Everything was created, everything was ordered and it all has a purpose to be fruitful, to increase the in number. It all has a purpose that, that works together, in what we see around us. And, and we have a purpose in that as well. We have a purpose in our relationship with the, the created order. To, to fill the earth and to rule over it. To be good stewards of it. We have a purpose in, God has purposed our, our, our relational life with each other. The way that we are to live in relationship with each other. He's purposed our, our identities when it comes to everything from from work and hobbies and gifts to gender and sexuality. He's purposed our marriages. He's purposed everything. And friends, we don't get to redefine that because it's right here. It's in scripture, God's revelation. That's the way it is. God created it that way. And you can actually see all of that laid out already 
in the book of Genesis. And what we see, if you read through Genesis 2 in particular, is that, that we were designed for perfection. We were designed to live in perfect relationship with God. God, li- God was with, he walks and talks with Adam and Eve in the garden. This is why everything about scripture points to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ comes to do what? Die for our sins so that we can be restored in our relationship to God. He says in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Like, I want to come in. I want to be in relationship with you. If anyone opens the door, hears my voice, I will come in and eat with that person. They will eat with me. Colossians 1, we've been kind of walking through that, says this, for God was pleased to have his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things in earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. This is the reality. God has purposed everything. You read Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything and for every activity, for every season and activity under the sun. And he goes off and lists that. And he talks about how everything, right, has been made beautiful by God, purposed by God. But one thing is unique is he set eternity in, in the human heart. In other words, he has designed us, humanity, for relationship with him. And in the end, in Revelation, we see that that purpose is realized once again when the dwelling place of God is with humanity. See, the dwelling place of God is with humans. He will be their God. He will dwell among them. That's the whole point. We are created for community. We are created for relationship with him. And this was what God wanted from the very beginning. And so we see that God's design is very clear in Scripture. But it doesn't take long to look around and see that God's design is broken. And it's broken because of what? Sin. Sin. Oops. I couldn't find the easel this morning, so sorry, this is a little awkward. Sin leads to brokenness. And brokenness is probably the easiest conversation to have because we all experience it in different ways. We experience it in the brokenness of our relationships. Even if you're happily married, you've experienced a little bit of brokenness in your relationships. The brokenness of of worry, fear, anxiety, the brokenness of addictions, the brokenness of, of so many things. And, and what do we try to do in our brokenness? We try to fix it. We try anything we can do to try to make our brokenness better. We work really hard to try to make our lives right. But everything, when it's pursued apart from God, just leads to nothing to more brokenness. The only way that we can be restored is through what? Thank you. (laughs) The only way that we can be restored is through Jesus, the gospel message. The gospel is the truth that The reality that God has made a way for us to be in relationship with him. To get out of the brokenness of our lives. To be healed. To be freed from that. And the way that we do that is through belief. Repentance. Right? Scripture says that we are called to leave our life of sin. We are called to repent. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when we do this, we are told that Christ enters into our lives, that we are washed clean in his blood, and that we are given the Holy Spirit, which empowers us then to once again pursue 
and recover, recover, and pursue God's design for our lives. This is the true gospel message. The brokenness that we experience comes from sin. And sin is prevalent in our lives, whether you're a believer or not. But God has made a way. And he calls us. He calls us to repent. He calls us to believe. He calls us to the truth of the gospel. I, I came across a quote this week that is I, I, I just so... I, it just, it really got to me today. It, it, the quote is this, busy pastors are always looking for something to preach. And man, I can tell you from experience that that is so true. Every Sunday, we have something that we need to preach. But the reality is, what we should be doing is looking for something to live. A truth that we can live out in our lives. And friends, this, this is something to live. We were created for God's purpose. We are created to give glory to him. We're broken. I don't have to convince you of that. Right? You can, it's just all you have to do is be honest with yourself. You look around the world and see this, that sin has led to brokenness. And there's so many things out there that are competing to try to give us some semblance of, of recovery, some semblance that, that we have a purpose and whatever else. But that purpose apart from God is ultimately nothing the way that we are to recover God's design in our lives is not through our own self-improvement and work, right? The gospel doesn't begin with a big do. It begins with a big done. The reality that Jesus Christ has done it for us. And when we believe in him, when we give our lives to him, when we repent of our sins, we believe that the gospel is true, that God has redeemed us in Jesus Christ. And we claim Jesus as Lord of our lives. He gives us his Holy Spirit to recover and to pursue his design for us. The reality, the reality for us is that we are all somewhere in here. Because you notice it's kind of like the recycling sign, right? Around and around and around it goes. Because <laughs> even when we're in Christ, we're still pursuing God's design, but we find ourselves here in brokenness all the time. And, and, and the question then becomes, where do, where do you see yourself there today? Or maybe you're talking with a friend and you end up in a conversation where they're wondering what this whole church thing is about. And they're talking about something in their lives that's going wrong. The hurt, the sin, the brokenness that they're feeling. Friends, this is a simple tool to talk them through where they are. In your bulletin, if you have one, there's a, there's a diagram, the same diagram. It looks nicer and it has scripture in it that can help you walk through this conversation. What does the Bible say about this? Right? God created all things for his glory. He designed them himself. Sin enters the world. We're going to talk about this next week. And the brokenness, which leads to death. Right? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And when we confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that Jesus is who he says he is and that he did what, he, what, what the Bible says he did, that we are given new life, right? Everyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Friends, this is truth for you, it's truth for me, and it's truth for the world that desperately needs it. If you don't believe today, if you are here and, and you're not a believer, you haven't given your life to Christ, I ask you this question. Where do you see yourself in this circle? Like, where do you see yourself on this diagram? And what is stopping you today from moving towards belief and faith in Jesus Christ? And if you do believe, and friends, I have another question for you. What is stopping you from sharing this truth with the people around you in your life? Is it fear? 
Is it anxiety? Is it shame or guilt? And maybe it's time that we preach the gospel to ourselves once again and remind ourselves that we don't live here anymore. But that we are able through the Spirit to pursue God's design for our lives, to go into all the world and preach the gospel, to make disciples, to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, you have called us to be your ambassadors. As if you were making your appeal through us. You have chosen to use us, your people, your church in this world. But we know that you don't need us. You are God and you can do anything. But because you have called us to this, Father, help us to take it seriously. Help us, Father, to feel your Spirit's presence, to look for the strength that you give us that we could indeed boldly proclaim the good news of your son, Jesus. Father, we pray that you would instill this in us, this message, that, that we, can, we can bring it with us wherever we go. That we can, that, that, that we can be heralds of your kingdom in the places that you've called us, our work life, our school life, whether we're on the road or whether we're sitting at home, that we can talk about it with our children, we can talk about it with our neighbors, we can talk about it with our coworkers, with our families, whoever needs to hear it, Father, please, we pray that you would give us, bring us opportunities to share this good news. And Father, we thank you. We thank you that you don't send us out alone. We thank you that you don't leave us in our misery. But Father, that you have redeemed us and that you go with us, as you say, to the very end of the age. Lord, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. Help us to be to be your ambassadors this week in Jesus' name. Amen. Whoops. One of the oh no, come back. Batteries and water. That's not that's not a bad thing, right? Ah. We're created for relationship with God. One of the things we just talked about. One of the images of that in our lives is the celebration of the Lord's Supper. That we are welcomed to his table to commune, the, the root word for community, with him. To fellowship with him. Invited by him, the Lord of this great feast that we will experience in heaven. This is a symbol of that. It's also a reminder of the gospel. That Jesus is who he said he is. That he died in accordance with the word of God. That he was buried. And that he rose again from the dead. Signaling the defeat of death for all time. The final stamp of understanding and approval that Jesus was God's son. That God raised him from the dead. That he is Lord of all things, even of death. And we are welcomed at his table because of what he has done. Every week, or every time we celebrate communion, we use these words. They're actually words from St. Augustine, I believe. Be what you see and receive what you are. You are the body of Christ. So be the body of Christ. 
The body of Christ is called to bring the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere they go. To be ambassadors for the kingdom of heaven in our lives, in our families, in our works, in our work, wherever we go. These are mission kingdom outposts for us to bring this good news. And Jesus invites us to his table. If you believe in me, you are welcome. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are welcome here. Regardless of age, regardless of denomination, if you believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, whether it's been for 10 minutes, 10 years, your entire life, you are welcome here. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and we had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples. He said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. In the same manner, after they had eaten, he took the cup and he poured it out. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for the sins of all people. As often as you drink it, remember me. 